Good evening, everyone. Welcome to 15 by 4 Munich and our online event of tonight. For those who don't know us yet, just a couple of words what 15 by 4 Munich is. We are a science communication organization and we share knowledge for people, by people. And we do it in Munich since April 2017. We want that everyone can get access to the knowledge, to the scientific knowledge, to the technological knowledge. And that's why we uh, organize regular events. Uh, we used to and hope will be in the future organize offline event, events, hosting each four talks of 15 minutes about different topics in science, technology, arts and humanities. And now we are in the online format for a bit and hope you also enjoy it and learn something interesting today and get to know our interesting speakers. Facebook and YouTube. So if you're watching us and you like what's happening and if you think your friends will like it, please share our live stream, invite your friends and links to your friends and family for our YouTube uh, videos so that they can also join and ask their questions. And don't forget that each platform, wherever you are watching us, Facebook on YouTube has a place for the chat. So there is a chat box where you are welcome to post your questions and our speakers will answer them. And today the focus is on the questions. So we are in time. Uh, just to give you a little update or information about 15 by 4 Munich, we, as I already told you, exist for three years already in Munich since April 2017. And we have had 34 events so far with over than 120 speakers and different talks and over three and a half thousand guests have visited us in different locations in Munich, uh, including Google, TUM, uh, Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry, uh, JetBrain, Stylight offices, and hopefully we will get to see you also in person soon in one. And today we have a special event uh, that is more focused on asking questions because we thought this is more fun for the online. So we will have again, as usual, four talks, uh, four topics for speakers, and each of the speaker will have 15 minutes. Within these 15 minutes, they will give a short introduction of the topic, and then you will have a lot of time to ask your questions. So today's format is ask me anything about, and you will have a chance to ask uh, Nina anything about social cognition, ask Paul about the night sky, ask Ivan about Inca empire and ask. So focus is on asking questions and answering them. So please don't forget to let us know what questions you have in our chat box. By the way, let's check our chat box right now. Please write us from where are you joining us today uh, and we will Hope that you are joining us not only from Munich, but also from other places and hope that tonight we can make your event, uh, evening uh, more fun wherever you are. Don't forget that at the end of today's event, we will have a lottery and you already see a list of people who on uh, questions that were posted on our social media channels uh, during the last two weeks. And uh, these are people who answered at least three questions correctly. And between these three, uh, 18 people, uh, we will do a lottery for these two interesting books. One is by Oliver Sacks uh, called The Mind's Eye. And another one is on a Psychobiotic Revolution by Scott Anderson. And these are very much connected to the topics of tonight. And yeah, let's stay until the end to see who are the lucky winners of these two books. Without further ado, uh, let me just remind you once more that chats are there for you to ask questions. Uh, please, you can start asking questions already during the introduction by the speaker so that by the time the, the uh, Q&A session starts, we already have some questions. And please be active. We are here and our speakers are here tonight to answer what bothers you, what, what you find interesting about the topics. So now let's give a stage to Nina. Uh, who is ready to tell you more about social cognition and Nina. And here I give you now space to share your presentation. Uh, thanks, Victoria. So when people hear about psychology, 
what I mostly think of is psychotherapy. So the treatment of people with psychological diseases. However, this is only an admittedly big subdiscipline of psychology. It's the field of clinical psychology. Psychology in general is the science of our mind and behavior, and there are many subdisciplines. For example, there are psychologists study how we process and store information. Another example is developmental psychology. Mostly developmental psychologists study how our behavior and thinking develops in babies or children, but they also deal with changes in adulthood. And there is social psychology. Social psychology studies how our behavior is influenced by other people around us. I'm a cognitive psychologist by training, and right now I'm working in developmental psychology social cognition. Social cognition deals with how we process social information. So humans are very social animals and we are very specialized in processing social information and we need this ability all the time. So for example, for our interactions to be smooth, we need to recognize social information, process it, and then make assumptions about what other people might feel or think or intend to do. And if we're not good in that, there may be many misunderstandings. And social cognition. Imagine this is you and your girlfriend is looking at you like that. So you ask her, hey, what's up? And she says, nothing. Now you need to judge. Is there really nothing that bothers her? Or did you do something wrong? What might you be bad about, mad about? Well, I will show you some social cognition that you would need in this situation. Maybe you can tell me in the chat what skills you think you need to figure out the situation. So how would you try to find out whether your girlfriend is mad? And maybe we can afterwards. So for this interaction to run smoothly, you need different abilities that all subsume on the social cognition. On a very basic level, you need to be able to recognize and identify faces so that you know that this is your girlfriend. This may be an ability that we're already born with and uh, babies that are only a few days old, they can already distinguish human faces from other face like shapes. And as grown ups, we are so trained with seeing faces that we basically can see them everywhere. understand where she's looking, so where her eye gaze is directed. So is she looking at the jacket you're wearing that she hates, or is she rather looking at that girl standing right behind you that you had a fun chat with a minute ago? Understanding the gaze of another person is a very important source of information, and it is something that children can do by around nine months of age. At least then they understand that there is a lot of information to gain when following the gaze of other people and to see what they are looking for. Information, you would need to use your theory of mind. That's the general ability to think about the thoughts of or intentions of other people. So if, for example, your girlfriend was indeed looking at the girl right behind you, you might assume that she's thinking that you're having an affair. Um, theory of mind is one of the most difficult part of social cognition and children can only do it by age four. At least then they know that the thoughts they have are not necessarily the thoughts that everyone else is having. So from the example that I just gave you, which actually is a very difficult one, or from the fact that children take years to master it. And you can maybe also see it from your everyday home office life right now, where a lot of social information that we usually use um, is lacking. Um, however, we are still incredibly good at social cognition. And although some lower level aspects of it can be mastered by non-human animals, it still may be something that is uniquely human. So studying it and understanding it shows us And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them now. Wow, thank you very much, Nina.
that was very interesting and a great food for thought. And I already have some questions. By the way, while you were talking, I was looking at our chat and I saw we have people joining from all around the world. Basically, we have people from the US who are joining us tonight. Cool. Hey, guys. Thank you for being with us. We have many people from Munich, which is not surprising, but still cool. <laughs> uh, and we have people from Göttingen and Norway. So wow. really diverse, really cool. Um, before we go into more questions from the chats, let me ask you a bit more about your current research work. So as far as I know, you as a PhD researcher work on, with kids on social cognition. So I'm wondering, how do you even do this with kids? I mean, they're small, they cannot really tell you much. If you ask them, they like, eh. Yeah. Um, have you ever been to an experimental psychology, uh, to a psychology experiment yourself? Um, uh, with the fMRI, so I've been in the okay. mesh. Tasks. Yeah, so mostly they are pretty simple tasks, actually. Hmm. For example, you take adults and sit them in front of a computer and you say, okay, press this button every time there is a red square. And then they sit there for an hour and press this button. So this is obviously something you cannot do with little babies or kids because it's a boring task at first. So most of the adults don't manage to do it for an hour and babies won't. And also they don't understand what you want from them. So um, what you do with um, children research is that you may need to make use of they are doing what do they have fun with so it's mostly a game like interaction and i'm working with babies so with five months old actually right now and they cannot even talk so this is more difficult and then for example we put two different pictures on a screen uh, on different sides and then we record their eye uh, their looking direction and see if they look more to one side or to the other side and um, then we say if they look more to the one side that's maybe more interesting for them that's more like the stuff that we do with mm. babies. Interesting. Uh, let me go and check the chat. And by the way, guys, you will now see both uh, Nina and me on the screen. Uh, and you also see two chats. So we are using a bit of complex uh, setup here. One chat is from our Facebook video and one chat is collecting from uh, the YouTube. So don't be surprised that you see this too. Uh, wherever you are watching us and wherever you will type your questions, we will see them. So here's one question. Uh, can social cognition be affected or changed by culture or community values? Uh, things that are very basic, like face recognition, that probably mm -hmm. are not very culturally affected. Um, still it is. Um, for example, you might experience that when you go to a different culture, different country, uh, like you go to Asia, for example, that you have difficulties in telling the faces apart. And this mm -hmm. is actually a thing. Um, so, yeah, it is culturally in affected and especially like higher levels of social cognition, like theory of mind and interpret mm -hmm. uh, interpret very different from cultures yes hmm. interesting uh there are more questions about kids that mm -hmm. i'd like to ask you um when do you feel i guess when, when do you think kids start to develop ethics what they decide to follow absolute ethics rules or that they can be critics with themselves um so actually um I don't know if I can answer that question because, mm -hmm. as I said, I'm not a developmental psychologist by training. Moral psychology actually in my lab. So um, how do kids make moral decisions? Mm -hmm. um, and it is something that children like around four or five years also start to develop. Mm. Um, so you need to be able to think about others first, like the theory of mind that I talked about, which is only available by four years. And then you can only start to make moral decisions yourself because then you can consider, okay, maybe if mm. I'm doing that, the other person's feeling bad. And so I need to decide differently. In this regard, how do you uh, understand or how can you test when um, kids have this theory of mind? What kind of experiments do you need to do for this? 
um, there's one very um, classical test mm -hmm. um, in that there's um, there are two people. So, for example, a mother and uh, the son. And the son has a bar of chocolate mm -hmm. and he puts them uh, in his toy box and leaves the room. And the mother says, okay, chocolate doesn't belong in the toy box and goes to the kitchen and does it. And children are told this story. Um, and then they are asked, now, if the son comes back, where will he look for his chocolate? And actually, children under year four, they will answer, of course, he will look in the closet of the kitchen, because that's the information that the child has. Of course, mm. the mother did put it there. And they cannot make this distinction that the information they have is not necessarily the information that the son has. Mm. And then if you are able to do this theory of mind thing, then you say, of course, the son will look in his toy box because he still believes that the chocolate. We could have tested ourselves as well. Yeah. I hope all <laughs> you guys thought it. the boy will look in, in the, the toy box. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see um, what else. So there is one more. Uh, how social cognition changes with age so you said there are things that only develop at certain time uh other other uh, periods when sudden changes happen in the adulthood or teenagers are teenagers different from adults mm. so it changes still in adulthood because there's a lot of change happening in the brain mm. um and a lot is going on there but i think that of course you get better with experience and in like interpreting people and getting feedback if your interpretation was right or wrong. Um, but I don't think that there is like a big increase like in, in childhood. So once you mastered like social interaction, um, then you're basically fixed, although you can still train it. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, interventions um, social cognition and um, they can they can still learn to be better mm. but this needs training yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well there are many more questions going in the direction of kids actually so they, we touched <laughs> a very interesting topic here um, here's one uh, do you think extensive use of media and therefore digital interaction affect children's development uh, in terms of social cognition and some other skills, social understanding. So, to say that media is bad, because there are also a lot of opportunities for children by using media, like uh, educational uh, games. There are a lot of them and children can get better in using that. And mm -hmm. um, especially older children, um, they can feel connected to their friends using um, media as we're all doing basically in social distancing times right now. And that's also something that's very important in the development of children. If it does affect social cognition, so I wouldn't say it necessarily makes it worse. So social cognition on a screen as we mm. all experience also right now. So you need kind of different skills. You need to concentrate more on voice or face instead of um, body posture, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say it makes people worse in it, just different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there are probably some studies done in this direction. Do you know that, do your colleagues work in this? Uh, with in media Munich? consumption, yeah. actually, no, no. Mm. Um, the only research that I know about is like on war. War games. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, maybe that's for the next time talk. <laughs> uh, I see there is a question connect if there is a connection between ethics and theory of mind, but I think uh, Nina already touched on that. So we, um, for development of ethics, theory of mind seems to be necessary, right? Otherwise, it's hard to uh, really develop a feeling of ethics. And uh, cultural background influence we also touched upon. Um, but you mostly mentioned, Nina, that there are differences um, 
people's appearance, for example, like different um, uh, ethnicities have a bit of different appearance. Do you know if there are studies that show some specific cultural differences, like between countries uh, or religion maybe has influence on social cognition? Mm, um, I'm not aware of any research saying that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something I can look into and answer later and uh, okay. provide some reading, maybe. Yeah, maybe we can also post this um, as a follow-up sessions today. So if you have some more questions, feel free to post them now. We're almost uh, over with time, but we can transfer all the questions to Nina afterwards and she will provide additional links. And for the end, I wanted to ask you Nina, a bit more about uh, your research work again. So you work with uh, babies and what are the questions that you research, what you try to find out? Um, so I'm working on the self-concept. So hmm. what I'm looking at is when do um, babies when are babies able to recognize their own body as their own? To talk about themselves, like I did this, for example. Mm. And um, that's yeah something that is pretty new, like in psychology research, to study it with um, really yeah, experiments. Um, and what we are focusing on is how social, the social world of the infant, ha of the baby, has an influence on this self-concept. So we're looking oh. at um, how the parents interact with the baby and if there are certain things they can do to help the baby develop a self-concept or if it doesn't. Wow. I, I wouldn't think it is so important, but uh, very interesting too. I'm looking forward to the results of your PhD project to find out more, but that Maybe. seems to be very interesting. And how old are the babies who you work with? So we start working with them when they are just five months old, uh -huh. so pretty young. And then we follow them up until they're two years. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we see the same baby a lot of times. I see. Wow. Very interesting. I'm excited and looking forward to the results. For sharing uh, many interesting ideas and information about the social cognition. I hope this also inspired our guests to read more about this. And as promised, we will take on your questions and ask Nina for additional reading suggestions for further on. Thank you, Thank Nina. You. Now I will go for a bit to my presentation and before we go to the next uh, talk and next uh, ask me any to tell you how we miss you guys. Uh, we miss our audience a lot. We also struggle uh, being at home separated and we miss a lot all the interaction and networking that we usually have at our events. And we know that many guests also value this interaction as a very important big part of our events value. And that's why we came up with a, a nice tool that is called Random Coffee that you can all join. And we encourage you to join if you're interested to meet new people. Uh, this is a small chatbot that you install on um, your mobile phone and each by Formuli community. And if you want, and then if you have time, uh, you will be suggested a new person and then you can arrange a meeting and have a call. Uh, I'm taking myself uh, part in this and I had six very interesting uh, meetings already. This was a lot of fun. I get to know new people and also learn more about people who are already new. And I hope you join us. Uh, you can find it either by following this QR code or this link. Or if you go to our Facebook page and find the section for services, you will find the description and the link there as well. The more nice interactions still going on in our community, even during quarantine. And now let's go to our next speaker and our next uh, Ask Me Anything session. So Paul is coming from IT background, but he's a passionate astronomer amateur astronomer but very knowledgeable he is also running a blog about astronomy uh, for over 10 years and he is very happy to talk to you tonight about the night sky so let me stop
Beach Pole. Hi there. Good evening, Victoria. And I'm glad to be a part of the program this evening. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking a little bit of an introductory uh, couple of slides with some thoughts about the night sky. Uh, as Victoria mentioned, I'm an amateur astronomer. I'm an observational astronomer. What that means is I like to go outside at night and just look up. And sometimes I'll do that with the naked eye. Sometimes I'll use a, a tool like a telescope. And I want to encourage everyone to do that as well. We're living in a stressful us are stuck indoors uh, for much of the day with, with a lot of video conference. And it's just so refreshing and so nice to walk outside and look up at the sky. And if I can inspire you to look for a few things, maybe that'll make it more fun. And uh, let's see what we can discover about the night sky. So let me click through here. When you look up at night, even in a big city, even here in Munich, well, okay, not tonight, it's cloudy. But most nights, we have some clear, clear, clear days coming up ahead. And for those of you that aren't in Munich, I hope you're having clear skies today or tonight. Pattern. You can look for the moon. You can look at planets like Venus. You can look for interesting configurations in the sky like star clusters or interesting groupings that form even bigger patterns. And when you go out at night, as I mentioned, you can just look up with your eyes. You can use a telescope if you have one or even binoculars. Many people don't think of using binoculars at night, but believe me, if you take a simple ordinary pair of binoculars that you might use during the day for, for nature or for sports, you will be amazed at how much more you can see, even when you're in a big city, even when there's light pollution, those binoculars will get you closer, will get you more magnification and get you more brightness to what you can see. Or a telescope, I always want to encourage people, if you bought that telescope years ago and you haven't used it in a while, take it out, dust it off and set it up outside when you have a clear night and gaze up in the sky to see what you can see. So for example, one thing that's always fun to look at and always so interesting is the moon. And the moon day cycle will go through all of its phases from a very beautiful thin crescent in the evening in the west into a, a full moon and then into a morning moon which as it gets smaller and smaller the waning phases until it's just a small crescent that rises up just before the sun and looking up at the moon at the different phases especially if you have binoculars or a telescope you will even notice more subtle detail because the moon is lit more from one side or the other or directly face on as it moves around the earth. So there are great apps, by the way, that you can use. I showed the one a few seconds ago uh, with, with a, a, a application that I use on my laptop called Sky Safari. And that is really great, not just for getting to know the sky, but if I'm gonna go out at night, I can plan ahead and know what objects I'm gonna be looking at and which parts of the sky to look. But most, or a lot of mobile phones nowadays, a lot of, of uh, these phones will also include the capability of having an app. I use one, it's one on the right called, I can actually point it up in the sky and as I move it around, the pictures on side of the Starwalk change depending upon what I'm pointing at. And it makes it just that much easier to know what you're looking at and be able to get the most out of your minutes outside looking up at the sky. And there's so much more to look for, so much more to talk about. Why don't I stop right now for a moment, uh, ask me anything you want about the night sky and I'll be happy to share a few thoughts. Great, thank you. Sharing your screen that, yeah, we go full face. Um, I'm very sorry for you guys that there is a bit of technical lag in the sound sometimes. We are trying to figure out on the technical end, uh, but I hope still everything is understandable because there's very small glitches. Please bear with us. Uh, we really want to discuss more with you about the stars and everything. Uh, so thanks, Paul. And there is already one question in the chat, and this comes together with what I wanted to ask. So what I thought to ask you first, 
where should I go to? I don't want to go far, like I go out from my building and what do I do? And the question from the chat is also in this direction. So where is the best spot in Munich to observe stars? Right. Well, you know, living in a city, Munich or any medium or large size city, you're facing light pollution. So your challenge, you're, you're, if you stay in the city, which, you know, you can go out any night, you don't want to have to drive too far or go far. Assume you're going to deal with the light pollution. But what you can do to combat it are two things. The first one is take a little walk, right? Away from where you stay, from where you live. Any or some viewpoint, make sure you don't have any street lights hitting you. So your first challenge is just to take five or 10 minutes and find a spot where there aren't street lights. For me, I walk a short distance. There's a little bit of a green belt. And as I walk into the green belt, there's some trees, which are not great because they take away from some of the view. But also, it makes it reasonably dark where I'm standing. So that's part one. Mm -hmm. And part two is that you actually just have to have patience. If you're inside at night with your lights on, probably, the first thing you're going to see is, is probably nothing. You aren't going to see any stars at first because your eyes are adapted for indoors. Mm -hmm. So your okay. task as an observer, even in the city, is to get on that little walk, and during those five to 10 minutes, as you're finding a darker spot, your eyes will begin adapting to the dark. And that's going to make all the difference. Because if you don't do that first, you're going to miss out on most of the fun. So you have to have a little bit of patience, and then you'll see a lot more. Okay, cool. So then, but it's not so complicated. Two, yeah, to the part two of the question, mm -hmm. uh, even just a few kilometers outside of the city limits, you're already getting away from a lot of the, the glare of the city lights. Mm -hmm. So I've been out in the, the Perlacher Forest, which is to the south of Munich. And I've also been out even to Ostpark, which is not far from where I live here in the eastern part. And again, the most important thing is you look around your horizon and there aren't any bright lights. That's step one. And step two would be that you've got to be in a spot where, if, if possible, you have as few trees as possible. So you're in an open space or an open field. Comfortable to get patient. Um, I have these little recliner chairs. They're called zero gravity <laughs> chairs. You put one of those out, you lie back, and it's just, it's spectacular, right? So it, it's, it's a little bit of just taking that extra distance to get a, a few minutes away from the city. There are some really fantastic places if you drive out um, even further. I'm thinking like Holzkirchen and then a little bit south from there. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a bit of a trek and you're going to, you know, you go up some hills and some mountains and then it gets really dark out there, but you're still not in the ultra darkest spots. If you want to get to the really of the Alps or summer where really you're, you're a good long distance from any town. Hmm. Okay. So maybe there are some plans for the warmer weather, not like today, but yeah, today, unfortunately, I was hoping tonight would be a perfect night for everyone to just race out and enjoy, but uh, we got to be, the other thing I'll say about, about stargazing, I lived in San Francisco for many years and over there, there was more nights with clear skies and you can mm -hmm. take it for granted. Hey, let's go out on Friday, stargazing. And on a Friday, guess what? It was probably clear mm. in this part of the world, because we have a lot more weather, you have to go. So if, if tomorrow it's clear and you've got plans, well, take five minutes out of your day, anyhow, of your evening, and just look. And then the next day, if you have plans and, 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 it's, and it's, you're thinking you want to go out and it starts raining, well, then wait another day. But the minute you have those great like, clear skies and when the weather's nice, try it out. Hmm. Okay. Thanks for the inspiration. Let me check what kind of questions we have in the chat because we have quite a lot. Um, okay, there are two questions. Do you know of any astronomer festival in nice places where one can go camping, where one can get really clear skies? I guess the second one you kind of answered partially. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, to be honest, in Germany, I'm not an expert on some of those really great dark spots. And I know there are festivals. Now, this year is an unusual year, and it's mm. probable that some of these things uh, won't happen. But there's a particular, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to actually reference something right now. There's a, a website called Astro Treff. You know? 
This is a German language website. It's also, by the way, and they have a lot of good resources throughout Germany in terms of clubs, in terms of events that are happening, places to buy telescopes, the best places to go stargazing, uh, well beyond my knowledge on some of those subjects. Mm. Living here in Munich, for example, I'm a member of the, the Volkssternwarte, mm -hmm. which is in, in the eastern side of the city. Um, I give talks there sometimes. They have programs most nights, again, not right now during the, the virus, but typically they do. And that's also a great place to meet like-minded people who are interested in the same things. And the year where they go off in a dark spot, and that's mm -hmm. where I was with them a little bit away from Holzkirchen. Mm -hmm. And when people bring a lot of telescopes and they go to one of these dark viewing spots, it is really impressive. That's what's called a star party. And it's one of my favorite things to go do is to be at the star party where you've got maybe eight or 10 or 12 different telescopes set up and lots of really nice people who just want to look up at the sky together. Sounds great. Well, thanks for all the tips. And we definitely post the link to the, your blog later on that people can also check additional Another uh, good question. Can I increase my chances to see falling stars or is it just luck? Oh, you definitely can increase your chances. So every night if you walk outside and you just get yourself in a, in a, in a dark spot and you stare up into the sky, first of all, these days you're going to see satellites, especially if you go out about an hour to two hours after sunset. And there's a whole new constellation of satellites called Starlink that uh, oh. SpaceX has been launching. And they are super obvious when they go by. You, you can't miss those. They're, they're very look. But on any given evening, you'll also spot a few random meteors or shooting stars. Mm -hmm. But there are special times of year. There's about seven or eight times throughout the calendar year on an annual basis where there's a reliable meteor shower. So Sternschnupper auf Deutsch, right? Mm -hmm. where you can rely upon there being a lot more meteors in the sky on a single night. The one that is one of the most favorites is called the Perseid meteor shower. It happens on August 12th and 13th. And this year we're going to have a favorable conditions with that. There, the only trick is you just got to, again, get that recliner out or get a blanket out, lay back and just let your eyes look up and wait and be patient. And every few minutes, you know, another one will come zipping right by. It's those are amazing. Those are so much fun. But oh. there are by, by the way, to finish the thought, they're all, yeah, sure. all around the year. There's another one in, in November called the Leonids and one in December called the Geminids. And we had one a few weeks ago called the Lyrids. So they're happening throughout the year. And all you have to do is just search on your browser for, for meteor showers calendar or something like that. Mm -hmm. Ones that are regular. But basically, you're saying every night it's possible to see something falling. You will. It's inevitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so much space junk. We get hit by literally millions of pounds of space debris every night. Mm -hmm. We'll see it in the form of little grains of sand-sized particles that we almost never see. But once they get a, even the size of a pebble and it hits mm -hmm. the atmosphere at 20 or 30,000 kilometers per hour, it lights up the sky right over where you are for just a few seconds like that, and then it's gone. And that's happening all the time. It's just that mm. but when we have meteor showers, it's a longer story, but there's a reason why we get a whole lot of them in a single night. Hmm. Okay. So patience, that's what I understood about stargazing. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. Some people are very much enjoying the app. Thank you very much for suggestions. Um, here's one more. What was so special about the recent series of supermoons? A supermoon is a full moon that's... Here's why. When, when the moon is, is going around the Earth, it, it doesn't go in a perfectly circular orbit. It goes in an elliptical orbit, which mm -hmm. means for a short while it's a bit closer, and then it zips out a little farther. That's an ellipse, right? The ellipse, elliptical shape. So if the moon's a bit closer, it will look actually bigger in the sky. Mm -hmm. So that, and if that happens to be the same day as the full moon, guess what? We call that a supermoon. Mm -hmm. It's about 
let's say 10 to 15% bigger than a normal moon. So, and it just feels like it, it's bigger tonight. And it really is, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a very nuanced thing because um, once the moon has risen, you know, when a moon is rising, just like when a sun is rising or setting, sometimes it looks really big on the horizon. Mm. It's down low because you have the horizon to compare it against other objects. But as it moves up into the sky, I hate to say it, but to me, a super moon looks like a normal full moon. So, <laughs> but, but, it, but it's great marketing hype. And I like it because as far as I'm concerned, if it makes people pay more attention to the moon, it's a win. Time is up. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Evgeny will now post a link to your blog that people can read more. And hopefully we will also get some additional links and um, good suggestions from you for our follow-up posts. I also heard you are giving a talk at the Sternwarte in a couple of weeks, which will also be streamed so people can from, watch it from anywhere in the world. So right. we will post about this as well. Thank yes. you so much. My pleasure. Yeah, so the lady, Jenny, and uh, yeah, let's see what's waiting for us next. And before we go to the next talk, what I want to say is happy birthday, Lily. So today is the birthday of one of our great team members and great speakers and our inspiration for science communication, Lily. Lily, thank you so much for being part of our team for all the time, for helping us uh, bring our events everywhere. You can see including one in Frankfurt, so not only in Munich. And Lily was also our savior in a couple of times when we had a fallout of the talk on a short notice and then we needed to come up with a new talk on a very short time. And Lily always had so many interesting topics in her mind that she was willing and passionate to talk about. Thank you so much. And if you guys uh, will, I will be happy to see more comments congratulating Lily with uh, her birthday in our chats now. I think she will be happy to see the one to our next uh, session. So we just talked about the night skies and the stars and astronomy. And you know who was also very good in astronomy are some ancient people and, for example, people in Inca Empire. So now Ivan will give you a short introduction about why Inca Empire is so interesting to him. And then he will be uh, able to answer your questions about that. So Ivan is, a re is uh, from business background, but he's very passionate about the sure you will get a lot of insights about Inca Empire now from him. Welcome on the stage, Ivan. Please also don't forget your camera that we see you and enjoy, and enjoy. together with your presentation. Yeah, your presentation. Hi, Victor, and thank you for reminding me about this. Um, and happy birthday, Lily. I didn't want to forget this one. So, guys, as Victoria has mentioned, I'm passionate about history, especially about the unique paths of some cultures. That is why I chose the Inca Empire for today's talk. What course in its history. I will Sorry, Ivan, let me just let shortly me break just you. Break you. Yeah. There is a bit there of a a sound, bit of problem, sound on problem on your side. On your side. Can you please double, Can you check, please your double check your microphone? Wait. Can you hear me well now? It is a bit better. Yes, I think Should it I is ask? better. OK, start talking. Okay, I will, I will just continue. So, I would say Inca, I'm planning on giving you why I will shortly walk you through the story of the empire's foundation and growth and describe its economy and science. And then I will also have to mention its collapse and the reasons behind it. The Inca empire was founded in South America in the 15th century, only several decades before Columbus reached the New World, in fact. By the time the first Europeans came into contact with the Inca people, 
This territory had stretched over thousands of miles and consisted of millions of multi-ethnic subjects. The empire was highly centralized and was un. It constructed a vast road system, palace complexes, and farming terraces, and was known for its riches. In its zenith, the Inca state was comparable to the Roman Empire in the Old World. It was huge, it was powerful, it had sophisticated administration, and it was a cultural melting pot for the whole region. However, it also included a few bizarre features dramatically contradicting what we believe is fundamental for every successful state. Well, I just told you that it was similar to another big empire we usually know in Europe. However, I'm going to talk about what made them started as a small city-state in the Andes. However, it took them less than a century to expand from a little town in a mountain valley to a continental empire. This expansion was, in fact, so swift that the emperor who initiated was called the Earth Shaker for a very good reason. In a lifetime, a small tribe had become the ruler of the then known world. Let me say a few words about the economy as I promised you. While the Inca rules with impressive efficiency and statecraft, they lacked one common element of most other complex societies. It did not have a currency, internal trade did not exist, and private property was probably an unfamiliar concept um, at the low individual level. The state owned the means of production and personal taxes were paid in labor instead of money or goods. The state ad administration designed all major activities and redistributed food and materials when necessary. One could see the Inca Empire was a textbook planned economy, although with low complexity. Its level of technology is also worth considering. Despite all modern conspiracy, the Inca Empire remained at a very primitive level of technology and science. Even when it ruled over a diverse population counting in the millions, it did not have writing, did not use the wheel, and lacked knowledge of most metals. To illustrate what I mean by primitive, let me give you an example of how the Inca used to send long-distance messages. In medieval Europe, this was done by writing a letter and transporting it by a carriage. In the Inca Empire, the message was memorized by a scout as they couldn't write letters, who then set off running to his destination. Parts or other vehicles. There were other scouts with fresh strength situated along the way, who ran for a while with the previous messenger, who repeated the message until they memorized it too. Then they ran further, replicating the process until the last scout on the chain transmitted the message. It is really impressive how big an empire can become, even without any substantial science and technology. Nevertheless, the inferiority of Inca technology contributed to their downfall. In 1532, a small group of Spanish conquistadors managed to defeat gigantic Inca armies in several battles repeated. Steel weapons and armor, they were mostly invincible for the middle-poor Inca military. The Spanish also applied much more clever diplomacy and political tricks. At the same time, infectious diseases, such as smallpox, to which the Inca did not have immunity, ravaged their settlements and at the end killed the majority of the empire's population. To summarize, without a market economy and almost without any applied science, the Inca empire rose to unmatched glory in no time. However, it fell at the hands of only a few hundred adventurers carrying swords and germs, Pandit. As I find both its essence and its collapse so, so different than most other episodes in history, I would be glad to discuss those questions in more detail with you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Unfortunately, I still hear my echo. So my suggestion would be, can you switch off your microphone? Yes. When I talk, exactly. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's try to <laughs> help our listeners. Um, yeah, thank. That's what's very interesting. I already have. How did they manage to do like trade and everything without having money? Don't forget your well, money. Well, as I said, they didn't do trade. They didn't have an, an internal market, which means that, like on the one hand, uh, on the one hand, they did this rather primitive exchange of goods in the local community. For example, one guy had potatoes, the other guy had fish. So they exchanged it. 
um, in a way, however, this wasn't real trade as it was very often dictated by the local administration. wasn't eaten immediately and to redistribute this this these materials or goods to other members of the community or sometimes even to other parts of the empire for which this gigantic road system really helped so they didn't really trade so they didn't need money okay makes sense well then another question so what was there with the writing and uh, how also how do we know stuff about Inca Empire? I mean, it was basically destroyed as far as I know. How, how do we learn about it? Great question and a very logical one. Um, the thing is, the Inca Empire developed very quickly. It existed as a very small kingdom for centuries, and we know very little about this period for obvious reasons. It didn't have writing. But their imperial period is only about let's say 100 years long, or even a bit shorter. So when the first Spanish conquistors came to the Inca Empire and basically destroyed it in a couple of years, there were people living that actually remembered most of this period. So living memory was existing uh, when right And some Spanish missionaries or conquistadors uh, wrote down the stories of the Inca. Or on the other hand, Inca noblemen or just Inca people who were Christianized and learned Spanish or Latin writing wrote the story of their people afterwards. So one could say that this like huge chunk of story of the imperial period we know is more or less written by witnesses' accounts. Very interesting. Uh, there is already one question in the chat is how social pyramid or was everyone equal or what, what is known about this? Well, although the Inca Empire like seemed a bit communist like with this planned economy, as any real communist state, some people were more equal than others. Uh, for example, like the Inca Empire was ruled by its omnipotent like god emperor, like the Sapa Inca who presided in its like capital of Cusco. And he was more like a god to the society. Um, then the empire was divided in... There was like the empire of the four parts of the world, which were like north, south, east, and west, uh, all centered in the capital, which was pretty smart, and each had its own governor. And going further down the chain, um, every administrative or social unit had a sort of a ruler or a governor who then presided over let's say, 10 smaller units down the chain, reaching the unit a uh, single family. So it had a very strict hierarchy, both in terms of like administration and also in the military. Uh, and every or even 15 persons up the chain who were responsible for parts of their life. So pretty hierarchical, wow. Um, what do you think would happen if conquistadors didn't come and they, they, the Inca Empire wasn't destroyed? Would it last until now? Or what do you think will happen? Luckily, you asked what I think, because I wouldn't know what would happen. Uh, but what I think is that, um, I guess it would... Researchers even believe that the Inca Empire was already in its, let's say, downfall when the conquistors arrived. For example, when the Spanish arrived to South America, the Inca Empire was already in, in a state of civil war that had just ended. And civil wars, in many cases, um, stand for inefficiencies in the administration. And in my opinion, the Inca Empire became really big. But this lack of, of technology, and especially lack of writing, was a major to, and let's say, if you take the Roman Empire, it collapsed, some people think, because it just became too big for the level, for the technological level of its administration. Well, the Inca Empire became equally big, but had much less like than the Romans. So I guess it would have ended one way or another. 
Well, okay, makes sense. Uh, I also wondering what was the relation of uh, Inca Empire with other states in Southern America that existed at the time, like Maya and. Um, that is probably a sad part of Incan history that they had little contact with the Mayan and the Aztec society. In fact, they, I mean, they probably had some indirect contact with transported goods or animals, but they didn't know of each other. They were unaware of each other's existence. And I'm saying sad because some of those other civilizations had stuff that the Inca needed a lot, such as the wheel, which the Mayan had and such as writing, which the Maya had too. Uh, very sophisticated cultures inside South America, which were found, defeated, and conquered by the Inca. But when the Spanish arrived, the Inca, the Inca Empire only bordered very, or let's say, much more primitive tribes. So it didn't have as, as a neighbor any like higher culture, as they defeated everyone else before that. And they, for example, how the Spanish learned about the Inca were, um, I mean, they were in, in around Panama and they were on an expedition to the coast of the Pacific Ocean. And when of the very rich country called Peru, full with gold and powerful rulers, etc. So I would say that people up to Panama knew about the Inca Empire, but not like further north from this point. So interesting, what was the reason and why didn't Inca spread more around the region? I guess they just didn't have the time. I mean, they, they, it took them literally like 80 years to, to spread to... Perhaps if they had more time, they would have reached and conquered new lands as well. But at some point of time, Europeans came and killed or infected them all, so that was it. How about the horses? Would have horses be helpful? I mean, the one story is that European were so great because they had horses, which we can travel fast and everything, and not in America. I would say the issue with the horses is um, it has two sides. On the one hand, they are definitely a are building, uh, as it allows much faster transport, or it even has certain functions in agriculture or, or in administration. Uh, and they didn't have it, as they didn't have most other animals we know in Europe, um, such as pigs or sheep, etc. And on the other hand, like horses were indeed a very powerful like military animal. On the one hand, because they weren't seen up to this point, and they like aroused fear. Uh, in the local population. And on the other hand, they are like a perfect fighting platform, especially if they're sort of armored. Perhaps they would have fared better, but well, who knows? Damn, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Our, our time is running up, unfortunately. It was a lot of uh, interesting uh, things that I personally learned about Inca Empire, and I hope our guests also enjoyed learning about this uh, fascinating empire. And yeah, it's maybe sad that we did not wait longer for, to see and then adapt it better. But yeah, now who knows? Thank you so much. And thank you guys for your questions. Uh, and there are more questions that we will have to take for later. Okay, let me move on uh, shortly back to my lovely presentation. Uh, because I wanted to shortly talk to you guys what's coming next. Uh, as everyone, we of not really knowing how the situation with the quarantine, COVID, and everything develops in the next month. Uh, normally, our May event would have been our uh, event, last event before the summer break. But now we don't really know how the summer break will happen, if we will, if we are allowed to go anywhere and so on. 
So we will try our best to stay in touch with you to organize some more online activities. And if you have some good suggestions, what we should do online, uh, what kind of formats you like, do you want us to talk more with speakers? Do you like to ask Q and A sessions? please uh, let us know. We will be happy and please stay in touch with us on our social media because this is where we will tell you what's happening and hopefully, very much hopefully, we will coming soon back to you with our regular offline events and hope to see you again soon. And now we go to our last but not least speaker of tonight, Becky, uh, who will be ready to answer all your questions about gut-brain connection. That's a very hot topic nowadays. Uh, influence our brain and vice versa. And luckily, we have Becky today, who is a researcher in this field. She has a doctoral degree and she knows a lot about this topic. So please prepare your questions. And now I'm happy to give the stage to Becky. Welcome. Hi, Victoria. Very th thanks for the introduction. I'll just share my slide. In a second. Okay. Okay, guys, I have a confession to make. I think the brain and can control your behavior, your emotions, and your memory. Wow. But you know what isn't sexy? The gut. It controls digestion, absorption of nutrients, and pooping. Yes, pooping. But recently I've learned while the brain can respond to various chemicals, it's the gut and the microbiome that can respond to what we eat and by various ways indeed manipulate how the brain responds. But what is the microbiome? So the gut microbiome is located in our guts and it's main. So many of you may have the opinion that bacteria are actually bad for us, but actually you're wrong. Many, the majority of bacteria are actually unharmful for us. And they in fact have very important functions within our body. And here are just three of them here. So immune functions. Immune cells work to protect against disease or other potentially damaging foreign bodies. But throughout our life, our gut microbiome, so our bacteria in our guts, educate our immune system from a very early age. And they instruct their immune cells what function to do. Next one. When was the last time you ate a nice, shiny red apple? Well, guess what? Your microbiome helps you to digest all of that cellulose because your body is not programmed to do that. The next one, structural functions. The gut bacteria themselves can have direct and indirect effect on the local gut barrier cells. They can directly tickle them and stimulate them. But they can also release chemicals which alters their receptors. In a healthy gut, the bacteria help maintain a tight structural barrier to stop you having it into your bloodstream. Okay, so now I've told you what the bacteria can do, um, but how does this allow them to connect to the brain? Well, there are actually three magic ways in which the, the gut microbiome can talk to the brain. And I'm going to just briefly highlight these ones for you right now. So the first one, Nerves, this is one way in which the gut microbiome can talk to the brain. As I mentioned before, bacteria can produce chemicals and tickle cells. But guess what? Our guts can even produce neurotransmitter. This is the key chemical. And in fact, 90% of our serotonin, our feel-good neurotransmitter, is produced within our guts. There is a main nerve in particular called the vagus nerve, which directly connects the gut to the brain. And guess what? It turns out that the gut is an actual bigger talker than the brain because 80% of the vagus nerve fibers go from the uh, gut to the brain and only 20% go from the brain to the gut. Now, the third mechanism, oh, sorry, the second mechanism is via, via immune cells. are located in our guts and they become educated by our gut microbiome. These cells, the immune cells, can actually secrete molecules called cytokines. These cytokines can then enter the bloodstream and travel up into your brain 
and can alter the way that we feel. For example, if you um, are maybe coming down with a sickness or a bug and you start to feel sick, tired, lethargic, antisocial, potentially lose your appetite, we scientists sometimes call this. And not only this, the cells which secrete the cytokines, again, the immune cells can also go via the bloodstream into the brain and infect, affect our brain diseases. Finally, the last way in which the gut microbiome can talk to the brain, and that's via metabolites. So let's go back to food. The legumes, the fruits and the vegetables are examples of stuff which are digested by a gut microbiome to produce metabolites. One of these groups of metabolites is called short chain fatty acids. So short chain fatty acids can actually alter anti-inflammatory. Additionally, short chain fatty acids themselves can go from the gut into the bloodstream and into the brain. And recently scientists have shown that short chain fatty acids can actually alter a key brain disease called multiple sclerosis. Okay, so as you may have heard, there are many links for the gut microbiome and a various number of brain diseases. But for my PhD, I focused on stroke. And we found that short chain fatty acids, these uh, metabolites produced from, were actually encouraging the recovery after stroke via immunological mechanisms. And if you're interested in that, we can send you the paper later. But for now, um, I'd love to hear all your weird and wonderful questions about the gut and the brain. And I'll do my very best to answer. Um, so come on, ask any question. There's never a silly question. Great. Thank you so much, Becky. I have a lot of questions to you. So oh, let's gosh. start with a very important one. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen. That no, uh, question is that. What should I eat to become smarter? To become smarter. So um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any scientific studies which have looked at different types of foods to make you to become smarter, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. There are some interesting ways in which you can change your gut microbiome, obviously, by the foods that you eat. And um, so when you eat food, you should think that you also may be um, giving food to your microbiome, to the bacteria. And they also like certain foods. They don't like junk food. They like these vegetables and fruits um, and things like this. And this is what we call um, these bacteria somehow enjoy this a little bit better. And it helps maintain more a diverse environment in your gut microbiome, which is supposedly called a more healthy gut microbiome because there's many different species there. Okay. So basically just eat what my mom always told me to eat, the healthy stuff. Could be, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the chat. Um, different food habits around the world affect one's gut microbiome. How much does this affect the brain around the world? Well, I don't know if it, the studies about how it affects the brain, but there are many studies um, all over the world to show that your gut microbiome is very unique to where you live. Um, mm. And there's actually a lot of studies to show that you so for example, if you live at home with a partner, you share a lot of microbiome with them. And even hmm. your pet, for example, your dog, you share some of the microbiome with them. Hmm. And um, yeah, so it is also influenced by the foods that we eat, obviously. And there are many different dietary habits all over the world. Um, and yes, it does influence. Um, that's all I can say. The way it can affect brain development or brains, but it would be interesting to find out. Yeah, but I guess there is also studies that show that our gut microbiome is connected to the genetical traits, right? So in different locations, also people have different genetical traits if they are from this region originally, and this is connected to the gut microbiome. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, it could also be that genetically you're influencing your gut microbiome mm. composition as well, right? So it might be that the cells um, on your gut barrier, which can actually potentially affect your composition of your gut microbiome as well. Um, and as we've, uh, I touched on briefly, but the direction between the gut and the brain is actually bi-directional. It's more that the gut microbiome is a bigger talker than the brain, but there is still this bi-directional communication. Hmm. 
Okay. Well, very interesting. Let's uh, learn more questions in the chat. Um, that's the funny one. I heard about the gut bacteria transplant. Could you explain how this works? I'm oh. just imagining poop trans. I mean, oh. well, let's let's think. Let, let's not call it a poop transplant. So we call it a fecal microbiome transplant. So FMT. Okay. So okay, it FMT sounds a little is bit better. nicer. It sounds like poop transplant. Um, and in fact, yes, um, this is an. First of all, let me talk about it in terms of research because this is a fantastic method in which we can uh, examine how the gut microbiome can affect the host. There are, there are these mice and they're called germ-free mice. So these mice have been raised in an environment. And we can then pop in or do a fecal microbiome transplant of any microbiome we're interested in, for example, from a diseased mouse like Alzheimer's disease or something like this into the uh, germ-free mouse. And we can see how this microbiome affects the host by the immune system and any other potential brain effects. Um, yes, and in terms of clinical trials, so in humans, there's actually been recently approved uh, a fecal microbiome transplant for Clostridium difficile infection. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease and things like this. Um, but believe it or not, I think it was in the 1600s that the first fecal microbiome transplant was really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a very long time ago. And it's only recently since um, the antibiotic era, era that we're revisiting that bacteria can actually be beneficial to us. Hmm. Okay, so everything new is something uh, actually old. That's interesting to find out about this topic. Uh, there is a great question about your research. How do you see the clinical trans? advisable one day that people with high stroke possibility would be just prescribed certain diets well that would be the dream right um because currently mm. in stroke we only have one drug that we can give and it must be given within 4.5 hours of, of the stroke onset which is a very narrow window in order to help the patient um, and there's actually nothing for stroke patients in this long-term phase when they're recovering so we wanted to actually look at that because it's been shown that these stroke patients actually have a gut microbiome imbalance. We call it. Yeah, it would be great. I mean, what we thought in our research was that we can sort of supplement some of the bacterial metabolites and sort of encourage regeneration. And that's exactly what we found. So it would be great. Um, I mean, there's still a long way to go, obviously, before we able to transplant our research into human patients. Hmm. But the idea would be to um, supplement uh, the patients after stroke, in addition to current therapies, obviously, to sort of encourage the regeneration and kind of give more, um, yeah, a better chance of uh, recovery. Back to the chat and have a look what's there. Um, is it true that when people say it's your gut feeling, it has probably something to do with your brain, it's analyzing scenarios subconsciously? Say it one more time. <laughs> Let me just so um, how is this gut-brain gut connection is connected to this gut feeling that we say sometimes? We say, this is my gut feeling, that's why I want to do this and that. Yeah. Well, uh, feeling. I mean, we know that it can uh, communicate directly with the brain, right? Hmm. I mean, that's a tough one to answer, I think. Let me think. The gut feeling, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I guess, it, guess it's a various um, different parts of the brain sort of communicating into the gut. Um, I can't think of the answer right now <laughs> off the top of my head, unfortunately, but I'd be willing to do a bit of research and type an answer later on if that's all right with you guys. Sure. Uh, I... Because in my native language, we don't say gut feeling. Like we say that's intuition, but we never refer to the gut actually. So it's maybe something for English speakers. We also say butterflies in the tummy when you're nervous, for example. Mm. 
this is uh, this is another saying and I think there is some truth to it let's be honest I mean there's now been many studies which show that the gut bacteria can actually influence a, many, uh, a large number of mental health disorders mm. as well, um, in particular anxiety, depression, and things like this. And there's a John Cryan and Tim Dian who teamed up with Scott Anderson um, to write this psychobiotic book. Mm -hmm. Um, are really, really focused on this in particularly. And uh, they've, they've, I've met them in person and they're some great mm. scientists. They know a lot about it. And yeah, the book itself is really interesting. I've just bought it myself to give it a read. Okay, so here's a hint for people. Please wait until after Becky's uh, talk now uh, that we will give away one of these books. Mm -hmm. Let's see for another interesting question. Are for the gut and then for the brain. Mm. The easy answer is I don't know. That's that's the easy answer for that one. Well, um, again, that might be ties back with the dietary changes, which uh, all, are altered all over the world, um, mm. and saying that the composition is very influenced in where you come from and the diet that you eat and the environment that you have and the stuff that you're licking. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see if we have uh, one last question that I can. Mm -hmm. By the way, what did you say about the tickle cells? Did I hear <laughs> that right? Yeah, it's because um, bacteria are moving, right? So it's sort of a mechano sensor that we have in the gut. Uh -huh. And um, so this can sort of stimulate uh, the cells in the gut and can mm. actually send signals via the vagus nerve up into the brain. So I translated that into tickle because I think that's a lot more fun. So just because of the moving yeah, the already. Interesting. Cool. Um, is it known enough about the microbiome that getting our microbiome examined for medical prevention is useful? Well, that's that's a very interesting question and, and a very advanced question, because um, actually when I, I did a study in my master's and we actually found that um, when we uh, took um, different microbiome compositions and we treated with the immunotherapy drug, we saw different responses. Just mm -hmm. so the, 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 the drug was um, acting differently depending on the microbiome composition. Mm -hmm kind of amazing to us and I think this is becoming more and more evident in the field and that's a very interesting topic in the scientific field at the moment whether or not we should be thinking about um, microbiome um, sequencing in order to give the best sort of medicine to the to the patient but um, yeah although technology has advanced in terms of sequencing the gut microbiome so characterizing what species are in there um, unfortunately it's not as fast as we'd hope so it's it's very expensive with technology it's not plausible to have um everyone's microbiome quickly tested hmm. so maybe right now if you go to the doctor they cannot tell you so much yet yeah but research is ongoing and we hope that in the future this will become possible i hope so yeah and then maybe people who are want to contribute, you can uh, find out if there is a way to participate in the study, like provide your microbiome samples, right? And then be part of some uh, study that looks at the differences of the mm -hmm. microbiome and the effects. Well, I think it was last year or this project mm. was just completed mm -hmm. and everything was released in nature. And they had, um, well, they focused on three main diseases, so irritable bowel syndrome, um, sorry, not diseases. Uh, they also looked at pregnancy and they also looked at diabetics mm -hmm. and they just explored the different diseases and they characterized um, how the microbiome looked in these diseases. Um, and it was some really great work um, with many, many authors and many, many uh, contributions. But if you're interested, I'd say go look at the papers online. Um, definitely. Cool. Thank you guys for participation and for the great questions. There is a couple more questions I saw that we will pass on to Becky that she can provide additional suggestions for you to find out more. Thank you so much. Uh, we hope to see you again as our speaker at some point later on. And now 
remember what we just discussed about the cool book. Uh, and one of these books will be a prize in our lottery. So we have two books tonight. One is by Oliver Sacks and The Mind's Eye. Another one on Anderson and co-authors. And as I showed you earlier, we have 18 people who took part in our uh, social media uh, lottery questions. So they answered at least three questions correctly. And now I will need to do some magic here and share with you the random number generator. So we have uh, numbers from 1 to 18. And let's see who are two lucky winners. The first winner will get the book of Oliver Sacks. Let's see who this person is. Number one to check later on. And the second number is 12. Wow. I did make this up. This is a random number generator. Let's see who are the lucky winners of the books. And these are number 12. Uh, person from Instagram with the name ending with 1306. You're a lucky person to get the Psychobiotic Revolution book. And number 13 is also from Instagram. So Resi Unzambet. Your book is by Oliver Sachs. Congratulations. Uh, our team will get in touch with you and figure out how to make sure to deliver books to your home address. And with this, we are coming to the end of our tonight's event. Thank you all guys for joining us tonight, for asking your questions, for being active in the chat. Uh, we enjoyed it a lot. We hope we come up with more interesting formats for the next weeks to stay in touch with you. Please connect to us on our social media. We have Instagram. Uh, we always are there as 15 by 4 Munich, 15x4 Munich. And we have all our talks of previous events on YouTube, 15x4 Knowledge. It has uh, English lectures from Munich and from other uh, cities that have 15 by 4 in English. Please go there, watch the topics that you find interesting, ask questions in the comments, and we will be very happy to interact with you further on. Now let's invite all our speakers to join for a short turn of uh, up. Thank you guys all so much for being with us tonight. Um, I hope you also enjoyed us answering questions and this AMA session. Thank you. Uh, let's keep in touch. I will be back to you with some additional questions for the follow-up posts and 